This tap and while the children's church dismissed. Also on the front uh, foyer, I do have uh, the work list that I told you I would have next week. And uh, so now this week I have it. If you have a chance to there we go, get the mic on right. But the work list is on the uh, front uh, counter there. And uh, if you can help with some of the stuff, that would be great. And some of them are a couple of people can do, some one person can do. But uh, if we can get them done, that would be a blessing. 1 John chapter 5, please. 1 John chapter 5. As we've been looking at the chains that bind, I've had some um, good texts and emails from some of our online uh, viewers, as well as people that are uh, part of the country of Canada and the United States that have both said that they've enjoyed the messages. And it's amazing how many Christians struggle with bondage. And it's not just bondage as we know, thinking slavery, but aren't we all born into being enslaved to sin? And after we get saved, is you'll notice that just because salvation comes into our life does not mean that we have immediate transformation. It's a work. It's giving it to the Lord. And as we look at the keys to unlocking the chains of bondage, there is some things that God has put in the word of God to help us give us the keys. The devil thinks because he has us in chains and has a padlock on it, we can't get loose. Did he not try that with the, de uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ? The devil put it in the hearts of the uh, Pharisees to impress Pontius Pilate to seal this tomb with a seal and Chain it shut so no one can get in. God doesn't care. The Lord Jesus Christ doesn't care. The Holy Spirit doesn't care about the devil's chains. The angel was just a symbolic figure of rolling the stone away. I think when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the grave, the power busted those, those chains. You know, you think about this. The devil has been using carnal methods to bind the Christians and we have stayed bound because we thought oh I can't break it you're right we can't break it that is why the victory comes through Jesus Christ our Lord if we look at 1 Corinthians 15 57 the key is he which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ it's through Jesus Christ we get the victory. It's not by our own strength and power. It's by the might of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning I'm going to give you four keys that is going to release us and keep us released. Because the Bible talks about that we are easily under the yoke of bondage again. The Bible says we are willfully put ourselves in that place. And that's where we say, Lord, I, I have a habit, I can't break it. And we try to do it ourselves. There's nothing wrong with having willpower and desire to break the bondage. But willpower and desire is not going to be enough. Because some of the bondages are pretty tough. Some of the habits, some of the things that we do are not just going to be done just because we will so. Some things are. But wouldn't it be great to do it under God's power? That way it's a lasting releasing of the bondage. Not a temporal one. But see the problem, God knows when the Holy Spirit came in our lives, He knows we need Him. That's why he said he won't leave us comfortless. But here's the problem. If we don't let the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ do it in our hearts, we walk around and go, I did it. This is the problem with a lot of programs, drug addiction programs, alcohol addiction programs, psychology, everything else, is I did it. 
I have been sober. I have been drug free for 28 years for this. So here's a pen. You know what it's basically saying? I did it. That's not the way a lot of these programs were started. It's not about God anymore. It's about, well, some pie in the sky, some higher power. And if you look at most addiction programs, and I'm not just talking about AA, but most of them that are offered by hospitals and things like that, it's all about you tribute to somebody and whatever you want to do, then it's all good. But it's you that does it. Folks, I don't do anything. And if I do, I don't do it well. It's God that does it. It's the devil that brings those addictions. It's the devil that holds those addictions overhead to where we feel hopeless. And I don't care what it is for addictions. If we're addicted to something more than we are to God, we're addicted to it. It could be anything. You might like to read, more, read books more than you love the Bible. You're addicted to those books. You might like to be, watch more television. You may watch 40 hours of television a week. I'm just laughing here. And 40 minutes of Bible in a struggle. You're addicted to television. See, it doesn't have to be just a substance. It could be anything. It could be your work. You have no problem getting up at 5 a.m. to go to work and spend 10 hours a day and love it. But to get up at 9 to go to church. Oh. Monday morning, 5 o'clock, I'm up and waiting to go. Headaches? No problem. Backaches? No problem. This pro no problem. You'll drag yourself to work because it's about the dollar. But church, oh, what is it? Bible? Oh, I can't read this morning. This is what God wants you to have that addiction to him. Are you addicted to Jesus or are you addicted to something else? What is your love and passion? Do you realize one day he will be the central theme of everything we do? He's in the center of heaven. There's one street and it leads to a throne. The Bible says so. This is what we've got to see. Why don't we get prepared to be addicted to him today? So that when we get to Jesus, it's going to be all the more joyful. Being the center of our lives. Look at 1 John 5. Here is something, the last book John begins to pen to the church. Revelation is a prophecy book. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Remember, these were all one book. They were later in the 1400s and 1500s, but in chapter divisions. And 1, 2 John. These were all the letters of John. So remember, this letter is to Ephesus and to the church. And he's writing about something that they all struggle with. And he says in 1 John 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ... Uh, that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that beget, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood. Even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to preach out of our copy of God's Word. And Lord, as the word is preached, would you work in our hearts to give us that victory over those habits that have so long ensnared us. Those snares that trip us up. The devil who binds us. This morning, give us those keys that we need to unlock the chains that have spiritually held us down for all these years. Lord, if there's one that's never turned the lock of salvation and been released from being a child of the devil to be adopted into the family of God, let this morning be. They see clearly what salvation is. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
the goal of any enemy is to bring a person, a country, or being in bondage. You look at history as, as a history buff. Every conquering country brings their conquered country into bondage, do they not? It is what they do. If they don't like a certain race, if they don't like a certain religion, if they don't like a certain ethnicity, they purge them. And it's horrible to see. It doesn't matter what it is. You look at the Great War, the war to end all wars. It was starting over ethnic purging. You look at World War II. What happened? It was over purging. The Jews and anybody that wasn't the Aryan race. And if you look on the eastern side, the Japanese were doing the same thing. Over time, the sad thing about it is man is inherently evil when controlled by the devil. The devil controls men to do great things. And when they're his child, they do his bidding. But you think about, oh, we're allies. We did better. No. We did some atrocities we shouldn't be done. Just because we're on the good side doesn't mean, why? People are all, until they accept Christ, controlled by the devil. This is where bondage has been. And folks, today's buzzword, once again, they're bringing up the past of nations. And yes, slavery was a scourge, but guess what? What about the children of Israel who were in slavery for 400 years? Who had their firstborn sons fed to the crocodiles? No one's standing up for Israel, are they? No one's punishing Egypt for them doing all the things. What about all the ethnic cleansings that's been going on in the Middle East and Africa for millenniums? And it's still not over. How many countries in Africa are persecuting Christians and no one is saying a word? This, I was reading the thing, Voice of the Martyrs the other day. The top five countries for slavery today in 2020 are in Africa. Why aren't we saying anything? There are brothers and sisters in Christ being persecuted because they believe in Jesus Christ. But see, bondage is around. Why? The devil wants to put people in bondage. And he knows that if the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and is taught, that it will bring freedom. And he wants to stamp it out. Tonight, I want to encourage you, if you can be here tonight, I'm going to preach on the, the, the doctrine of the church, but defining the church. I read an interesting article about how the devil used Constantine to issue in A.D. 313 the Edict of Toleration of Religion. And since then, the church has become diluted with toleration. And before then, the church was a powerful, motivating influence in shaping the world into becoming a Christ-like image. And look at it today. And you know what brings about great evangelism? Persecution. I was reading about some of the African countries that the Christians are being persecuted. They're meeting everywhere. You read about North Korea. <coughs> you read about China. You read about Iran. You read about, guess of all places, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, where Christendom is martyrdom. And you know what's interesting? Their churches are growing. Why? Look back in the book of Acts. Persecution brings great purification of the church. And this is where, as you see what God is doing, he's trying to warn us here in North America that we have been and have a cushy Christianity far too long and that we ourselves have been willfully in bondage to the devil to where we're so complacent we don't even think. We want to say, oh, wow, North America has a bad past and doesn't every nation. Tell me a perfect nation and I'll tell you a lie. Every nation has a past. You have a past you're not proud of. 
But you know what history is? Learning from your past not to make the same mistake. Erasing history, you will make the same mistake. If you say you're perfect, you've never had a problem, you're going to make the same mistake. Folks, that's why we have history books. That's why, so we can look and say, hey, I don't want to be like that. That's why God included all the sins of the children of Israel. That's why God included every time that they disobeyed. Look at how many times in the book of Judges that God himself allowed his people to be slaves. To be able to say, hey, we need God. God is the only deliverer of those in bondage. Amen? Amen. I would love to rewrite history, but that will never happen. But one thing I can do is I can blaze a future in Jesus Christ. You know how I may not be able to release my brothers and sisters in the world from slavery or from martyrdom, but I can release a, release a person here from eternal death. All God said was, Gordon, go ye into all the world and teach all nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, which is my Oshawa, Judea, which is my Durham region, Samaria, which is my Ontario, and the uttermost parts, which is Canada and the rest of the world. I can't save the world. I can't do what I would like to do. But you know how you do it? One soul at a time. Each one, reach one. I never can comprehend how God uses the domino effect. It's amazing. An average person let D.L. Moody to the Lord. And look what D.L. Moody did. Over a million souls led to the Lord. An average person. You think about some of the people that led Great men to the Lord. And they were just nominal people that you would think, oh, he's a nobody. She's a nobody. But they want a somebody to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> That's the great thing about our God. He doesn't expect us to be the qualified theologian to go out and reach someone. He qualifies the cult. I'm unqualified. It's God that does the qualifying. And this is where the goal of enemy is bondage, plain and simple. No matter how much we fight, he fights harder to snare us. The devil does not change tactics. He uses deception. From the very beginning of time, he deceived Eve. What is he doing today? He's deceiving us. That's his greatest deception. He makes sin look pleasurable. He makes things look, oh, no one will ever know. Everything you see about the devil comes back to one word, deception. Amen? He's good at deception. He's a liar. A lie is a deception. You can say, well, he's this. He's a deceiver. The Bible says he's a deceiver of the brethren. This is where we got to realize if it looks too good to be true, let me tell you something. It is. He's deceiving you. And when he says that God doesn't care, he's deceiving you. When he says you don't have time for this, he's deceiving you. Every time we see the devil working, you can look at one word in that working. Deception. And deception brings us into bondage. Just one. Remember when we were all teenagers? Some kid comes to us and says, just one puff just one drink just one night with a woman just one night here one night there do this do that do this just one isn't that how it always starts and that one turns to two and two turns to hundred and hundred turns we're snared but he makes it sound oh are you a sissy or something come on real men real women you know he does that with deception but what he doesn't show you is what happens after the deception sin enters in as it said whereas by one man sin entered in he didn't show Eve what would happen did he 
She had no idea about the physical death. She had no idea about the childbearing. He had no idea about working. He worked and it was great. He was the carekeeper of the garden. But after the garden, work was not as fun as it was in the garden. That was the curse. The bondage is written about all through Scripture from the children of Israel to the child of God. This whole book is filled with bondage. There is not a story that goes by that does not have a bondage scene in it. And here's what it says. Then, but, hereafter, therefore. Great words like that. And then it shows you the bondage breaker. Amen. There are some hopeless stories in here, but if you keep reading, you'll show the victory of Jesus Christ in them. Time and time again, the children of Israel, Jonah, Hosea, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Peter. You look at it, time, God gives hopelessness, and then he shares the great hope. This is why this book scares the devil so much this is why he tries to rewrite it this is why he tries to erase it eradicate it and everything else because he knows this is the key to breaking the spiritual bondage of man i may never be able to break the physical bondage of many of our brothers and sisters no matter what nationality they are they're in bondage in this world for being christians but they're free indeed already. I've read so many stories of communist China, communist Russia, of pastors, laymen that were put in gulags, sweat camps, things that were atrocities you can't even imagine, and they are happy. How can you be happy? One pastor in Russia, I remember in the 1970s, put the entire Bible to memory and his psalm book. Because he kept being arrested and put in there. So his goal was one year was to memorize the Bible. And that's all he did. They put him in Siberia. They put him in an iron box. And stripped him of his clothes. Because they thought his clothes had the writing of the scriptures in it. And they gave him a blanket of their choice. And no other clothes. Siberia is not a warm place. And they tried to freeze him to death. And he would speak. He had such a commanding voice. That in that hollow of the winter. It would echo. And he would preach. And read the Bible. And he would quote. And he would sing his psalm. Because he committed to memory. And they couldn't figure out. Who is giving him the Bible. And he kept on preaching. Many came to the Lord. Including many of the guards. And he says, the only way you can stop me from speaking is kill me. But the problem was, the guards were afraid of him. Because he had the power of God upon him. And after the 1980s, when he was finally released, after 15 years in a Siberian gulag, he was able to stand freely after the communism per se fell. It's still around. And he was able to stand in his church and preach openly. And many people came forward and said, because of you, because of your witness, I'm a child of God. We may be in physical bondage, but we can never, with God's help, be in spiritual bondage. Amen. Amen. The Bible says we allow ourselves to be. Every bondage can be broken, but first there are some clear steps the Bible gives us that have to be followed in order to have lasting freedom in our Christian walk. This is what Christians strive for. Some are just happy to have a get out, get out of hell free card and say, I believe, but they're really not. They're just kind of walking aimlessly. You know, it's like being an ex-convict and you still have a record. You know what's the best being about a Christian? It's like being an ex-convict, but you have a pardon. In other words, your record's been expunged. It's nothing on there. 
Would you rather be pardoned or would you have a record? We all know we're ex-convicts. The Bible says we were once in bondage. But I love when God erases the past. And this is where it comes. Freedom is essential to success. And the freedom that is essential to success is salvation. There are many people that say a prayer. It's a profession, but not a possession. There's a difference. There's a lot of people that say, well, I'm going to say the sinner's prayer. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Amen. I'm going to continue to have. Wait a minute. Their desires don't go away. They still don't see the wrong in their sin. Folks, as we repent of it, we're going to see the wrong of our sin and our heart's going to say, I don't want to do it anymore. It's that new creature's going to say, hey, carousing around and being a whore, it's not right. Being a man that's unfaithful to what God's called me to be and my wife and this and that is wrong. But if it was taught in church like the Bible says so and salvation is by faith through grace that there's a new creature born in us then why is the church divorce rate, fornicating rate and adultery rate going up? The Bible says as we started this here it should not be named among us once. The Bible tells Timothy, he's saying, flee useful lust. But why is it going up? Why is the church allowing this to happen? Because the church is not following the word of God. Because if you preach the word of God like it should, we should be leaving this. Why has alcohol become common in place in church? Why is things becoming, why are we trying so hard to look like the world? in church than to be a different than the world like the Bible says come out from among them be separate worship leaders to be able to connect to their members are now getting tattoos of Bible verses and memory verses on their chests and their back well folks I will never take off my shirt to show you my chest so why would it matter if I had my life verse tattooed on my chest why does it matter that I have tattoos up my neck and on my face and all this and all that, so I can fit in? Why do I have to dress like the world says to dress in order to make you think I'm a preppy worship leader? Folks, you would not want me in those suit pants up here. You would all be laughing. But this is what I'm saying. Why are we conforming to make people feel comfortable when the Bible is showing us what the Bible says? Hey, we all have things in our life that we've done before we were saved but the scars will always be there and I use the scars God has allowed me to come through to share to people God's grace and God's mercy this is once what I was isn't that what salvation is about isn't that what mercy and grace is about this is what I was this is what I am but hallelujah this is what I'm going to be I'm not done yet and neither are you. God's still working on us. Amen? Amen. And this is where salvation comes. It's not about good works or just believing in God. Like a lot of religion says, I believe in God. And God shows himself to people throughout their lives so that they can see he is real. And he does that to draw you to him so that you will call upon him. I know people all across this world that I've talked to that have shared supernatural experiences of God showing himself real to them and directing them. God can do that. He's God. What he wants is you to say, I want you as my Savior. There's a difference in believing you that he's your God. But there's a big difference saying, he's my Redeemer. And if God has so blessed you with showing supernatural things to you, that's how much he loves you. And he wants you to be his own. And if God's doing that, he's not going to stop. He's going to continue showing how real he is. Amen. He's done it in my life and he'll do it in yours. Ephesians chapter 2 
It's not of works. It's nothing we could do to get ourselves saved. It's everything God can do. It's not of works lest any man should boast. It's for by grace you save through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. All you have to do, it'd be like me going to Matt and saying, hey, I got a gift for you, but you got to pay for it. It's not a gift. God so loved the world that he gave you. Put your name in that verse. God so loved Gordon that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, move out that whosoever and put if Gordon believes in him. He should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved me so much that if I was the only person on earth, he, I believe without a shadow of a doubt he would still die for me. That's how much. Because he said he's not willing that any one singular should perish but that all should come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. This is where Romans chapter 10 tells us once again it's a whosoever gospel. We want victory from sin, from doubt, from depression. We want victory from habits. We want victory from continue of those habitual sins. The Bible says in verse 9, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture said, Whosoever believeth on him should not be ashamed. And verse 13 said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is the first key of in freedom essential you know how many people I know and and many of you have talked to me about friends and family that's in your family that believe and they're trying hard to change their life and they keep falling down they keep struggling and they keep getting frustrated and saying if God's real why wait a minute you've limited God's ability in your life because you've never got that first key in the lock You're still trying to walk around with chains. You can walk. Do you realize you can walk a little while? They used to put the ex-convicts in a ball and chain. You know, you can walk for a while with that ball and chain. I've had the privilege of picking up some of those in historical museums. Heavier than I thought. And you know what happens? Your ankle becomes so raw it gets down to the bone because you can walk but you're dragging it and pretty soon as many of you guys know ladies and men we don't have a lot of meat around our ankles and after a while it gets wore out oh sure you can carry it but can you carry 10 20 pounds for a while you can't move very far when you're in bondage you can move Oh, the devil doesn't mind if you turn over a new leaf. devil doesn't mind if you become a new person. Just not a Christian. There's a difference. If he didn't mind, then why did he create so many religions? It's all about works. Making myself feel good. I'm a, boy, I'm an active member in this church. I give to the orphanage over here. I give to the food shelters over here. I give to the elderly and the poor. Hey, I'm such a good person. If that saved us, then we'll all be busy. But it doesn't. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Acts chapter 2. If you look at the verse key, verse 41, that they that gladly received his word were baptized in the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We notice that they said, now when they heard this, in verse 37, they were pricked in their hearts. In other words, they were convicted. They knew they needed Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You shall receive. You know what? When we get saved, we have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have a new Lord, a new king in our life, amen? But we have to repent. That means to turn from. Not from 
It's a mental choice that, hey, that lifestyle, I'm not interested anymore. I'm walking this way. The Lord repented. In other words, changed his mind. We have to think about this. It's not that, oh, wait a minute, I want to be saved, but first I'm going to kick the habit of here. I'm going to kick the habit of here. I'm going to kick the habit. Okay, Lord, now I'm not ready to be saved. Then isn't that not a works? We can't clean ourselves up, folks. You know what the Bible says? We're thoroughly furnished from the inside out. A lot of new versions put thoroughly. Thoroughly and thoroughly are two different things. Now, if you look at the, new diction the modern dictionaries, they say it's the same word. Eh, wrong. Look in the old dictionary, two different words. But see, they're trying to say that, hey, we're, we're just making it the right English. No, you just made it the wrong English. The old one was an inward cleaning. The Bible, God made no mistake when he put thoroughly over thoroughly. But the new dictionary says, oh, that's the same word. It just means thoroughly cleansed. I wish it did, but it didn't. Salvation. Real salvation will bring a real change, amen, and a strong desire to please God and to do His Word. When people make excuses why they don't want to do God's Word, I wonder if they ever had real salvation. Second of all, the second key is very important today. And we'll end on this one because these keys are understanding. They're simultaneously to be used for lasting victory. I wish that after the key of salvation, we never had need of the other ones. But that's not how God works. Isn't our walk in Christ a gradual walk? Is it step by step? Inch by inch? If it was so, then I'd be saved and I'd be going to heaven. I'd be skipping the middle part. Wouldn't we all like that? But that's not how it works. God has you here for a purpose. You are a witness. You're a light that so shines so that others can see Christ. God says here, salvation is not the only thing for victory. We, like the priest of old, we go from the altar. When you look at the tabernacle, you will notice that it was a rectangular building with one gate. And that gate led you to the altar of sacrifice. And that altar of sacrifice led you right into the Holy of Holies, right? Wrong. It led you to the brazen laver. New Testament, the Word of God is called the water a lot. Washing of the regeneration of the water. This is our soap and water, folks. To get off the dirt and filth of sin. How shall a young man cleanse his way, the Bible says, by taking heed to the law thereof? Hide the word of God in your heart, the Bible says. Why? That I might not sin against thee. This is our soap and water. Or if you want to say, this is the Windex to get your glasses clean so you can have 20-20, amen? I got done doing some things yesterday at the grinder and uh, I looked at what I was doing, and I was like, whoa, man, this is dirty. I looked at my glasses, and I was like, wow, I can't see. Until I clean them, then I could see. But I had to use some Windex to get my glasses clean. This is what we're trying to do to see that we can get our spiritual life clean so we can see sin like it is and spiritual like it is. Sanctification. The Greek word for sanctify means holiness. To sanctify, therefore, means to make holy. In one sense, only God is holy in Isaiah 6.3. God is separate, distinct. No human being or thing shares the holiness of God's essential nature. There is only one God. Yet the scripture speaks about holy things. Moreover, God calls humans to be holy. As he is holy. In Leviticus 11.44, Matthew 5.48, and 1 Peter 1 15 through 16. He called his priests to be holy. And as they went through the process of going to the altar, of getting their sins atoned, they then went and washed at the laver before they entered into the tabernacle. What was the purpose of that? 
Folks, they were in a desert. They just slain animals. Their tunics would have been dirty. And God did not want them to enter into the tabernacle dirty. Why did he make it high polished brass? Because they didn't have glass to make a mirror. <laughs> so they could see. Folks, have you ever tried to wash your face without a mirror? I did when I was a kid. My mom said, you missed a spot. No, I didn't. And she would go like this. How many moms did that? And, and you know, or, or took the thumb, or held your face, and you're like, oh, oh, yeah. And she gets those little boys clean. But my mom would take both sides of my face, lick her thumbs, and get it off. And I'm like, that's gross. But that's what moms do. They see, they're our mirror. We went, okay, we're washed. Okay, we're good. Remember, gentlemen, did you wash behind your ears? What's the purpose of that? Oh, you'll see you when you get older. But you know, the thing is, we don't think about this. But our mom and dad are older and wiser. And they said, you know what? Have you washed between your fingers and toes? And you're behind the ears and you're like, oh, yeah. But they're telling us to have a clean lifestyle. Because they know that they want us to remain healthy. This is where sanctification in 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, the Bible says in verse 3, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification or your holiness, that you should obtain, abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Every one of us, he desires that we possess our body in holiness and honor. And you know what the word honor here is respect. When we begin to respect God, it's like me honoring you. I respect you for who you are. You know when you walk before the judge and you say your honor, it's respect. You're calling him with respect. Or you walk up to an elderly person and say, sir or ma'am, you're honoring them. And the Bible says we ought to possess our vessel, our body, with holiness and with honor. Because you know why? We're bought with a price. The Bible says we're not our own. This is God's body. And this is where God is telling us, I don't want you to be in bondage. I don't want the devil to have a hold on you. I want you to have the victory that I so desire for you. First of all, I want you to know what true salvation is. Second of all, I want you to know how to possess your vessel in holiness and in honor. Because people are watching out. We live in a broken world. People are in hopeless states all around us. Someone dies and they can't cope. It's hard to watch a loved one die. It's hard to see the casket being lowered. But when you know that they have put their faith in Jesus Christ and you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and asked him to be your savior, it's not goodbye. It's good night for I'll see you in the morning. It makes death so much easier because the Bible says, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through Lord Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't say Lord Jesus Christ. It says our Lord Jesus Christ. It makes it personal. Religion makes it clinical. Christianity makes it personal. He's our Savior. He's my Savior. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and the belief of the truth. It's not us that makes each other holy. It's the sanctification of the Spirit. It's that constant working of the Holy Spirit in our heart. So that we can walk before him and be holy. First Peter 1 Peter 1.2 Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through sanctification of the Spirit. There we go. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. 
Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. If we're walking the life we need to in holiness, they're going to wonder, what gives you that hope? What gives you that strength? How can you go through this? And it says, be ready to give an answer. And that's why I love putting myself in with people. The world needs to see how a Christian handles life. Do I get down? Yep. Do I get discouraged? Yep. Do I get depressed? Yep. But how do I get over it? By putting a key and letting God turn it. Putting His key. Second Ephesians chapter 2 in closing this morning. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 and 13. Salvation and sanctification are two essential keys for great victory. Look at verse 12. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Notice the next verse. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Breaking down the wall. That was, I can still remember watching on TV. As the West Germans and the East Germans got on that Berlin Wall and swung with all their might to take down that partition that has separated their country for many years. Man, you just, you felt excitement for them. The East Germans who had been in bondage, who had suffered starvation and uh, horrendous things. The West Germans who were prosperous, they were not worried about their East, their West. They were Germans. And for once in 40 years, the wall was down. They were unified. Folks, our new man and our flesh are battling. The new man wants us no more barriers, no more walls, no more chains. The old man wants to keep us in bondage. This morning, God has given us some keys. We allow him to put in that lock and turn it. You know what's neat? I love kind of corny, but every time I hear that lock pop on that paddle lock, I can't help but think how that must sound to a person being redeemed. You know, you just have that click and you know the lock is undone. I was unlocking the other day the garbage can outside. One lock would not go. The garbage driver turned the lock up and guess what happened? Water and ice got in there. So I reached in the car and got a lighter and lit it for a while and heated it. Put the key in there, turned it. And because of the ice on there, it was just like a missile just like tink. but I was like yes it's unlocked the feeling why I had some garbage to throw away and while that lock was on there I wasn't allowed to use the, the garbage can for what it was intended for to be able to have that unlocked and get rid of that garbage my truck thanked it but you know the, that's how it is let God unlock that padlock on our hearts so that we can have that freedom 
we so desire. Through salvation, we begin our eternal walk. Through sanctification, it is a daily walk. Day by day, walking before God, as he said to Abraham, walk before me and be thou holy. He wants us to live a life of victory. And we can live a life of victory if we just believe that he can and he will. Don't doubt what God can't do because there's nothing he can't do. I can do all things through Christ with strength in me, the Bible says. And if one could say that like Paul, he said it with affirmation to the church of Philippi, I can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. That's why he tells the Romans, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what he wants you to do. Lead people to the freedom in Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior today, please reach out to me after service. I'll be glad to take the Word of God and show you how you can have eternal freedom. If you're struggling with things and the Lord's dealing with your heart this morning, let God work. He wants to work in your heart. Let Him give you those keys to release the bondage of the devil in your life. He wants you to know what it means to be free. And as the Bible says, free indeed. Amen. We allow Christ to release the bondage of the devil in your life. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, work in hearts this morning. You know the hearts that are in bondage from mine to each one of the pew and each of those online. Lord, if we're struggling with things that are holding us back, weighing us down from soaring to the heights that you so want us to be. As the Bible says, that in the ages of come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and the kindness toward us. Lord, you have great things planned for each one of us. Lord, if something is hindering us from getting there today, let this be the day we take the key you give us and unlock that lock that we may be able to walk in the freedom and liberty wherewith you bought us from. Have your will and way in our hearts, Lord. If there's one that's lost and undone that has never turned that key and released permanent hold of the devil on their life, let this be the morning. Lord, we ask you that you would just lead God and direct. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Every head bow.